Hi guys, in this video we're going to be looking at what a buffer solution is, acidic buffers, how buffers work, basic buffers, naturally occurring buffers, calculating the pH of buffers, and then finally we're going to summarise. So what is a buffer solution and why do we need them? Well, controlling the pH of a solution is often really important, especially in biological systems. This diagram shows a picture of an animal cell and there are loads of different examples within animals of times when pH needs to be carefully controlled. Buffers provide a way to give this control by taking advantage of equilibria to control the amount of H plus ions and OH minus ions present in the solution. The full definition of a buffer is that it's a solution which minimises changes to the pH upon addition of a small amount of acid or base. So it's important to realise that buffers cannot stop a pH change from happening entirely. The key part of this definition is that they minimise the changes and also they only work when it's a small amount of acid or base. They can be overloaded with too much. So now we know that buffers control the pH, let's look at the most common type of buffers we'll encounter. The purpose of them is to counteract small changes in the pH and so in the concentration of H plus ions. Acidic buffers are a mix of weak acid and its conjugate base. So the symbol for weak acid is HA. When we've dissociated the hydrogen, the symbol for the conjugate base is A minus. The role of the weak acid in setting up the buffer is to set up this equilibrium. So we have the acid, which for our example we're going to be considering ethanoic acid, and the height of the bar shows how much there is. So we've got quite a lot of ethanoic acid, which is then dissociating into CH3COO- the ethanoate ion and H plus ions. There's more of the acid because it's weak, so the position of the equilibrium is well over to the left. To give the solution lots of the conjugate base, which we said we needed for a buffer, we also add a salt of the weak acid. So for example, we could add sodium ethanoate to the solution. And when we put sodium ethanoate into an aqueous solution, it fully dissociates into its ions. We have a large amount here of the Na plus and the ethanoate iron and a small amount of the salt left undissociated, basically none because the reaction goes to completion. So now we've built up this huge amount of the ethanoate iron from adding the salt. Because the iron's in excess, it pushes the dissociation equilibrium towards the left. So we're talking about the dissociation of the acid. We've suddenly dramatically increased the amount of salt, the amount of conjugate base we have, by adding a salt, and then this begins to react with the hydrogen. This pushes the equilibrium even further to the left. So now we have a larger build up of the acid reservoir, and we still have a very large conjugate base reservoir from the salt, but now we have a small amount of the H plus ions in comparison. This is the system you need to set up to control the pH of a solution. We'll look at why it controls the pH in a minute, but just for now you need to know that you have the weak acid in excess and its conjugate base in excess with a smaller relative amount of H plus ions. So those are the things that form a buffer. We could have set this buffer up slightly differently. So instead of mixing the acid and the salt to get the conjugate base ions, we could mix a lot of the weak acid with a strong base. The acid and the base would react, which we can show here with the ethanoic acid and the sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. This reaction goes to completion and then would form a large amount of the salt here. From here on out, Everything is the same as if we'd just added the salt in the first place. This is just another way you can get salt into the solution instead of adding it directly. So we've now seen to set up an acidic buffer that we need to have the weak acid and its conjugate base in excess. But how does this work to control the pH? Let's think about what would happen if we added a small amount of acid to our mixture. This would increase the concentration of H+. So you can see that the H plus concentration shown here by this bar has increased from where it was before, at about this level. 
Now, because the acid and the conjugate alkali are in excess, so there's so much of the CH3COO- and the ethanoic acid about in the solution, all of the H plus we added will be almost entirely used up. And this re-establishes the equilibrium and keeps Ka constant. So if we think about the expression for Ka, what's happened here is firstly we've had an increase in the concentration of H plus ions, these have gone up. What you would expect at this point is for the Ka to also increase because the numerator has got a lot bigger. But we know that this can't happen because we haven't changed the temperature. Instead what happens after we've increased the concentration of H plus is to compensate some of the A minus ions are used up and some of the we create some more of the HA aqueous ions and during this process we will use up almost all of the excess H plus ions that we put into the solution. This counteracts the change that would have been made to Ka because now the hydrogen ions will have only increased a tiny amount and this is compensated in Ka because the A minus ions and the acid concentrations have decreased. The important thing to take away from this and remember is that Ka is constant at a constant temperature no matter what. So what does the new equilibrium we form look like after these excess H plus ions have been used? We've had a slight increase in the concentration of acid and a slight decrease in the concentration of the conjugate base. But because there was only such a small amount of the acid added, these changes don't end up being very significant. And because we now have nearly the same amount of H plus as before we added our little bit of acid, the H plus concentration has only changed very slightly from before we added the acid, which means that the pH also only changes very slightly. This is the buffer action. What about if we added a small amount of alkali to the solution? Well, when we add the alkali, the OH ions will react with the H plus ions to form water. This uses up the H plus ions. So as far as our equilibrium goes, initially we would have seen a decrease in the concentration of H plus. But because the acid and the conjugate alkali are in excess, the decrease in H plus will be almost entirely compensated for and replaced by more of the acid dissociating. This re-establishes the equilibrium and as always Ka stat stays constant. So again in the two stages this happens. Firstly, because we've added the alkali, we get a drop in the concentration of H plus ion. So secondly, to re-establish the equilibrium and keep Ka constant, we suddenly get an increase in the concentration of A minus ions and we get a drop in the amount of acid because the acid has dissociated to replace the H plus. This returns the H plus value to roughly what we had before we added our small amount of alkali. Remember, you can always explain these changes by starting from the fact that K is constant at constant temperatures and then trying to think about how you would avoid K changing by either creating more products or react. So now in the new equilibrium, we've had an increase in the conjugate base. The amount of acid has decreased as more of it is dissociated and the hydrogen ions are back to their concentration or very nearly the same as before we added our small amount of alkali. Again, remember this all works and the concentration of the H plus ions only changes very slightly because the acid and the salt are in excess and because the H plus has only changed very slightly the pH also remains constant and this is the buffer action. So if we summarize if we add a small amount of acid then the equilibrium will shift to the left to use up these H plus ions that we've added and if we add a small amount of alkali this will use up the H plus ions, so when we add alkali, the whole equilibrium shifts to the right, and this replaces the H plus ions that we've used up. Basic buffers are very similar to acidic buffers. 
except they're made from weak bases instead of weak acids, and then the conjugate acid. So it's just the other way round. And these maintain pH values of above 7.0. They work in a very similar way, though, with the equilibriums. You have an excess of the conjugate acid and an excess of the weak base, so any changes to H+, plus get resisted effectively by Le Chatelier's principle, where if you add H+, plus, it's used up, and if you take H+, plus away, more of the conjugate acid will dissociate. So we can see this with the diagrams, and we can also see what happens with the equations when we add a small amount of the acid. You see that it reacts with the ammonia, Ammonia is a very good example of a weak base, so it's often used for basic buffers to make more of the ammonium ion. The excess H plus is more or less all used up, and the concentrations of the NH3 and the NH4 plus remain roughly constant because there's so much of them in comparison. So let's now look at what happens when we add a small amount of alkali. The alkali reacts with the ammonium ion it pulls one of the protons off, one of the H pluses, which gives us ammonia back, and we'll also get H2O, which won't affect the pH. So now the excess OH has all been used up, but the H plus concentration has stayed roughly the same as before, as has the ammonia and the ammonium ion, because these are in excess. And it's this system that maintains the pH. So the thing to remember is that a basic buffer is made from a base plus its conjugate acid and has a pH of over 7. We said earlier in the video that buffers were useful in biological systems, and now it's time to look closer at a human example of this. So the reason that buffers are used a lot in biology is because the pH needs to be carefully controlled for a lot of life's processes to happen. For example, in humans, our blood plasma needs a pH value of between 7.35 and 7.45. It's really bad news if it drops below 7.3. We develop a condition called acidosis. This means our blood is too acidic. It gives us jaundice, fatigue and heavy breathing. It makes you very, very ill. If the pH rises above 7.45, our blood gets too alkaline, and we develop a condition called alkosis. The symptoms are different. You end up with nausea and confusion, and you don't get the heavy breathing, but they're both very bad, which is why you need to maintain the range between 7.35 and 7.45. In our blood, there are multiple buffer systems to help us do this. The most important of these buffers is the carbonic acid and hydrocarbon ion buffer, and this is one you need to know about. It works in the exact way that we've explained weak acidic buffers working so far. Carbonic acid, H2CO3, is the weak acid in the situation, and it breaks down into hydrocarbon ions, HCO3-, which is the conjugate base, and the H+. And then the buffer action works to stabilise the pH. If we were to add a small amount of acid to the blood, the equilibrium moves to the left to get rid of the H plus ions, and it re-establishes the pH close to what it was before. If we were to add a small amount of alkali to the blood, then H plus ions would initially be used up, but then the equilibrium would shift to the right, more of the acid would dissociate, and then would form more of the H plus ions, which would re-establish the pH again. Most of the materials that get released into our blood are acidic, and so the reaction that happens most is the hydrocarbon ion, HCO3-, combining with these protons that have been released with the acidic substances in the blood to reform the carbonic acid. At this point, an enzyme can convert the carbonic acid that we formed, that's this, the carbonic acid, into aqueous CO2. This can then be converted into carbon dioxide gas in the lungs and breathed out into the air harmlessly. This is why the rapid breathing we saw as a symptom of acidosis happens. It's your body trying to remove all of this excess acid. We've now seen an example of how buffers are used in the blood but let's look at how we would calculate the pH 
of a buffer solution. As with any solution, if we want to find the pH, we need to know the concentration of H plus ions. So we know that this comes up in the expression for Ka, so it's a good idea to start with the acid dissociation constant Ka and work from there. As always with the equilibrium constants, we've got the products on the top, and then we've got the reactant on the bottom, and we can rearrange this expression to give ourselves a value for H+, plus, which is what we want to then calculate the pH. Just as we did when we calculated the pH for weak acids, we assume that so little of the acid dissociates that the concentration stays the same. The concentration of the acid we put in ends up being the same as the concentration of acid at equilibrium. So then this allows us to put in a number for the concentration of HA at equilibrium, and we know we can look up the value of Ka. All that's left now is to try and find the value for the concentration of the A- ions, that's the conjugate base. All of these come from the salt, and the salt is ionic, so when it's in an aqueous solution, dissociates fully. All of the salt, so for example sodium with whatever the negative ion from the acid is, is going to split up into its ions. This means the concentration of the salt we put in is going to be the same as the concentration of the A- ions at equilibrium. We now have all of the data we need to calculate H+, and therefore the pH. So let's go through a simple example, just to make sure we understand. So the question starts by saying that a buffer solution contains 0.03 moles per decimeter cubed of ethanoic acid, and here's the formula, 0.07 moles per decimeter cubed of sodium ethanoate, which is the salt in this buffer, calculate the pH at 25 degrees Celsius, given that the Ka of ethanoic acid is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeter cubed. So it's always a good idea, when you're trying to calculate the pH, to find an expression for H+. We'll do this by rearranging the expression for Ka. So Ka is equal to the concentration of the A- ions multiplied by the concentration of the H plus ions, divided by the concentration of the acid. We can rearrange this to see that the H plus concentration is then given by the acid dissociation constant multiplied by the concentration of the acid divided through by the concentration of the conjugate base. So now, this is the information we need to know, because we're given Ka in the question. So to find this information, you just need to remember the assumptions we talked about earlier. Remember the assumption that not much of the acid dissociates, so the concentration at equilibrium that we're interested in is equal to the concentration of the acid at the start before any dissociates. Then, the concentration of the A- ions at equilibrium that we're interested in is just given by the concentration of the salt we started with, because all of the salt dissociates. This is information that is given us to the question, the concentration of the acid and the concentration of the salt. So now we know that the pH is given by minus the log of the concentration of hydrogen ions, and we can write in our expression for that. So that's minus the log of the Ka multiplied by the concentration of the acid divided through by the concentration of the A- minus ions. We now know we can find this information in the question. So if we plug in the numbers that were given, we've got minus log of the Ka, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5, multiplied by the concentration of the acid, 0.03, divided through by the concentration of the salt, 0.07. And then if we put this equation into our calculator, we see that the final answer is given by 5.14 for the pH. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised Smiley Face, and together, let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.